I'm very pleased to be here and uh, have, have uh, really enjoyed working with Ravi over the years, especially those, those years when we were working together when he was a student. So, uh, my outline is probably unreadable uh, on the right. I'm going to go over some of the basic results on uh, uh, planar graphs. And, uh, and then we'll, see, we'll start to see how they can be used in algorithms. I, I, I've been on this project recently to try to revi revisit many uh, now classical optimization problems, look at the algorithmic problems, uh, under the assumption that the input graph is planar. And uh, it turns out that you can get lots of better results, better in, in the sense that they run faster, or that you get better answers, or both. And uh, along the way, you get to exploit these beautiful properties uh, of these graphs. Now, I'm not going to start with anything particularly uh, deep or profound. Uh, I just want to make sure we remember the idea of breadth-first search and breadth-first search levels. So given a graph, this one happens to be planar, but uh, I want you to imagine that it's any graph. You can define uh, the levels, the number of hops from some arbitrary starting vertex. So here's the starting vertex, uh, and that's uh, its level is designated zero. It's zero hops from itself, and these these vertices are at level one. They're one hop from this from this starting vertex. These are at level three, at level two, and so on. Uh, so. Breadth first search is an algorithm that, ass it, it, uh, that assigns levels to the vertices. It also uh, can be interpreted as assigning levels to some of the edges. Uh, these edges uh, coming out of uh, that starting vertex are designated level zero. The next edges, the edges between level uh, one vertices and level two vertices are, are designated level one and so on. And you notice that some edges, for example, the edges between level one vertices are not assigned a level. Uh, and here's a, the edges, the, the black solid edges represent the breadth first search tree. So there's, it generates a spanning tree uh, of the graph. Uh, and of course, some but not all of the edges from one level to the next, to the previous one, are in the breadth first search tree. Okay, so that's just a little bit of introduction. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is, is talk about this, this crazy definition of graphs. Now, we all know what graphs are by, uh, by day four, whatever today is, I suppose. Uh, I find it useful to, to formulate graphs in a slightly strange way, uh, and it's useful. Um, in dealing with embedded graphs, graphs embedded on a surface. So, uh, given any finite set, E, consider the Cartesian product of, of E with plus and minus. So now, for each element of this finite set, E, we have two elements. So for, for uh, E, is this big E is an edge set. So for each E, edge E, we have two elements uh, I call of this Cartesian product that I call darts, E plus and E minus. Now the intended interpretation of this is that for each edge, there are two directions that you can assign to the, to the edge, and these are the plus and minus directions. Okay, uh, so I've drawn this, this graph here. This, so this is, this is edge uh, A, and it's oriented in this direction. And I'm going to associate with that edge, uh, the dart A plus, A in the plus direction. And the reverse dart is A minus, goes in the opposite direction. Okay, now let's look at a particular vertex, for example, this vertex in the middle. So look, look at the darts that are entering, that are entering this vertex. Okay, well, here F this arrow uh, labeled F is entering, its, its head is at V. So we'll say that F plus uh, has its head, the dart F plus has its head at V. Uh, similarly, the dart, uh, what is this, uh, 
uh, H has its, is it an H or a B? Um, has, its, uh, has its head at B. So we say, uh, we say H plus is, is part of that vertex. Uh, these two are pointed the opposite way. So what's the dark, what's the dark with the edge E that's part of the vertex V? E minus, right. So E minus and uh, G minus uh, also belong to that vertex. Now, the way I'm describing it, you're looking at a picture of a graph and, and figuring out which, uh, vertice, which darts are uh, touching which vertices. I want to turn that around and instead define a graph this way. So we'll define a graph to be a partition of the darts. Okay, so for any edge set, any finite edge set, uh, take the Cartesian product, now you have the darts. Now organize those into uh, disjoint exhaustive subsets. And this is what I call a graph. So a graph is a, is a collection of uh, disjoint subsets of the darts. So uh, the, uh, the, the subset that we interpret as the vertex V is the subset F plus H plus E minus and G minus. Now, and then you can go ahead and define walks and, and, uh, and paths and connectivity uh, with respect to this, um, this graph definition. Just wanted to point out that this definition, uh, among its virtues or flaws, depending on your point of view, uh, is that it allows for self-loops. So this is a self-loop, it's an edge whose tail and head are the same. Uh, here's another self-loop. It also allows for parallel edges, edges that have the same head and tail. But for many purposes, we'll, we'll be able to ignore that, that technicality. Now, one advantage of this, uh, of this definition of graphs is that it makes perfect sense to define two graphs having the same edge set. So we define the edge set uh, to be uh, A, B, C, D. Uh, you can have two, two different graphs on the same set. A, B, C, D, E. So, uh, so that's one of the advantages. And we'll, we'll see we use that a lot uh, in looking at planar graphs. And here's another point I wanted to uh, make about this. So here, let's say you start with some graph G. When you say it's set, it's like yes. The 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 uh, yeah, what I'd call the head and the tail of the dart. Yeah, they're both they're significant. Yeah. The question is, how is it possible to have two graphs with the same edge set but with different vertex sets? Well, a, a graph, fix the edge set, that determines the set of darts. So it's, it's just some finite set. Now take any partition of that set of darts. That defines a graph. Each block of the partition, each part, each subset of the darts is a vertex. Okay. So there may not be much connection between, there, there's no, there's no uh, inherent connection between vertices of one graph and vertices of another. So not only can they be of different cardinalities, they can have nothing what to do with one another. Combinatorially, there's no way of mapping between them. All you know about is the, is the edges. So I call this an edge-centric view of graphs. So what is the same as the edge So. It's, it's just referring to edges. So I, I want to be able to say this edge in these two completely different graphs. And right, if you had, if you had for example, weights, you could, you could ref, uh, they'd have the same, they could ha you, could, you could say they have the same weight in the two graphs. And that, we'd very often do that. Okay, so, so we, this is, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the advantages of this. Partially I'm just getting this definition uh, ma ma making this public because it, 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 I find it's very useful in working with planar graphs to use a definition like this and in other, co other contexts as well. 
Uh, some of the subtleties of that we won't get to uh, in these lectures. But does that answer the question? Yeah, OK. Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit, a little bit uh, takes some getting used to. Now, here's, a, here's another point. Uh, oh, you can hardly see that. There are lines there. Um, so normally, the uh, subgraph of a graph G is just a, another graph uh, whose vertex set and maybe edge set are subsets of those of the graph G. But very often, especially in dealing with planar graphs, we want to speak about the subgraph uh, in a way that doesn't lose its connection with the original graph. So I call that an edge subgraph. An edge subgraph is defined combinatorially by a graph and a set of edges, a subset of the edges of the original graph. And now you can still talk about uh, the, uh, uh, the, the connection, in, in, as it were, between pieces of that edge subgraph, which we, th we, we ordinarily think of as a graph, but we can also relate it back to the original graph. So combinatorially, that's useful. For example, what the, one consequence of this crazy edge-centric view of graphs is this. Uh, so a partition, a partition of the darts, is a, uh, a, a set of non-empty, disjoint, exhaustive subsets of the dart sets. So what does that tell you, for example, about the existence of vertices with no incident edges? So suppose I had a vertex with no incident edges. Could I represent it using the edge-centric view I've described? It, it, it would have to correspond to an empty set, which is not allowed in a partition. So, in fact, in the edge-centric view of graphs, there is no such thing as an isolated vertex. Now, that said, you very often have to deal with isolated vertices, but in, in my little world, they come up in, only in this context, as edge subgraphs of existing graphs. So, in this case, we've sort of ignored these, these edges around here, uh, uh, even though they're, they're part of the graph. We define the subset to consist of only these edges. These edges are not there, but we can still talk about that vertex because it's part of a bigger graph. All right. And here's another famous uh, graph operation. I don't know if, uh, if, if uh, this has been discussed uh, before, contraction. So contraction, uh, there's an obligatory uh, sound effect that goes along with contraction. Let's say you have an edge Okay, stretching between my hands. Contraction you think of as going like this. Okay, the edge is contracted, is squeezed and tailed, nothing. And then finally, the, its endpoints, its head and end tail, are identified to form a single vertex. So I've given two examples uh, here of, of uh, contraction. So in this case, we contract uh, this edge. Okay, so these two endpoints are identified. So this edge comes around, curls down there. In this, in this case, we contract this edge, okay? Uh, notice, by the way, that contractions, even if you have a graph with no self-loops and no uh, parallel edges, contraction can lead to both those. Uh, so you, they're really unavoidable if you're gonna deal with contractions. Oops. Okay, still a little basic stuff, probably seen this before. So this is, here's a graph, here's uh, uh, a spanning tree. So uh, there, uh, the, the, the bold edges uh, form a spanning tree because there are no cycles and uh, everything is connected. All the vertices are connected. Now, uh, once you have a spanning tree, an edge of that spanning tree is called a tree edge. Pretty simple. And, uh, Something, something's happening with my software. Oh boy. So 
do I get from using uh, slightly buggy software? So given this spanning tree and this particular tree edge, it defines a partition of the vertices into two non-empty sets, namely uh, the vertices uh, on one side of that edge and the vertices on the other side. This forms what's called a cut. A cut is, uh, is the set of edges that goes from one side of the graph to the other. So the cut in this case is this consists of these three ed these uh, four edges. It's the edges that have one endpoint in this side and one endpoint in this side. Okay, uh, this is called the fundamental cut uh, corresponding to ed the fundamental cut of this edge E with respect to this spanning tree. Okay, now here's an edge that's not in the spanning tree. We call it a non-tree edge. Now, corresponding to each non-tree edge, there's uh, a fundamental cycle. Namely, you take the path in the spanning tree that connects the two, uh, the two endpoints of that non-tree edge, join them with the non-tree edge, and you get a cycle. That's the fundamental cycle of an edge. Okay. Yep. Sorry? How do you define those? Well, no, you're given a graph. It's, it, you're given, you're given uh, a set of edges, which is just some arbitrary finite set, but you're also given the graph structure, which is given by the partition. So you can go through and uh, define them in the usual ways. Uh, so, I, uh, by the way, I should say, uh, I'm, I'm, basi I have, I'm basing this uh, lecture on, um, on lecture notes that are becoming a book. Uh, that are, uh, the lecture notes are on the, on the web, uh, and I'll, uh, I'll update them later on today. Uh, they won't completely correspond. There'll probably be some inconsistencies, but uh, you can also use that to go back and and uh, see some of the proofs. I'll, I'll do very few proof, proofs in the lectures uh, and, go, and go in more detail. Uh, that said, I'm happy to take questions here and I would like you to ask questions, but uh, for some of the details, I might refer you to those lecture notes. Yeah. So does that answer the question? Or it doesn't answer the question, but uh, satisfies you for the moment? Okay. Uh, here's another concept uh, I expect many of you are familiar with. Uh, so a permutation is, is, uh, is a, it's a bijection from a, a set to itself. Okay, so it's a function that maps each element to, uh, to an element. Uh, it's one to one and on to. And um, a particular kind of permutation is a permutation cycle. Uh, so uh, for the elements A, B, C, and D, uh, oh, uh, so it works like this, A is mapped to B, B is mapped to C, C is mapped to D, and I didn't show this, D is mapped back to A. So that's called a permutation cycle. Uh, the notation for that particular cycle is this, parens uh, A, B, C, D separated by spaces. That refers to the permutation cycle that goes, that maps A to B and so on. And uh, a, a very basic fact is that every permutation can be written uh, as a collection of permutation cycles uh, on disjoint sets. Okay, finally we're going to get to embeddings of graphs. So what we're leading up to is a combinatorial definition of embedding. So what is an embedding intuitively, geometrically? An embedding is a drawing of a graph on a surface. Okay. So you imagine a drawing uh, on, a, on a sphere or on a plane 
or, or on a torus or, or other kinds of, uh, of surfaces. And the, the drawing has to uh, obey the property that the drawing of two edges doesn't cross, that the intersection of two edges, uh, of the drawing of two edges only occurs at vertices. That's, that's the, common, that's the uh, geometric definition of embedding, but it's possible to define it combinatorially. And the, this, this idea goes, goes way back. Uh, I think Jack Edmonds was the first uh, one to, uh, to write it down uh, explicitly. So here's, here's a, uh, a graph, and uh, I've, uh, I've given you a drawing of it essentially an embedding in the plane. And now, here's the same thing, and I've made more explicit the, the, uh, the darts. Now, these, um, I can't see it very well. In the second drawing, I've shown both darts uh, one in each direction. Sorry? You had a question about darts? Yes. No, no. I just define it for any, any finite set that you want to work with. Uh, you give me a finite set E, I'll define, a, uh, I'll define the darts. This one? That is given to you, right? It's a directed graph and it is given to you. Then uh, there is a notion of t plus or t minus. If that's, it's going, it's useful in many of these, uh, our, well, all right, hold that thought for one slide. So darts turn out to be useful in a variety of ways, including looking at flow. I don't know if you've, uh, if, if, uh, you've looked at flow so far. Uh, in these lectures. But here's one place it becomes useful in defining embeddings. So give me one moment and then we'll see if this is helpful. So you've, get, you've been given a graph and each edge gives rise to a dart. So that's okay, right? Well, I, 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 like, to quote, uh, I like to quote from Baer's who wrote this uh, important graph theory book. Uh, of course, I can never remember exactly what he said, but he basically said something along the lines of, it would be convenient to say that there are uh, two theories. There, there's, a directed, the, the, there's a notion of a directed graph and there's a notion of an undirected graph, but that's not true. All graphs are directed. The question is just whether we pay attention to the directions or not. So I figured if it's good enough for bears, it's good enough for me. So I'm, I, I will very often ignore the directions of edges, but I'm going to think of those edges as existing nonetheless. Okay. So each, it, it, I've drawn these directions, and, and as a consequence, I get, I get these darts. So uh, for each edge, which is directed, sometimes we call it an arc to, to uh, emphasize the direction, there are two, two darts, one in each direction. Now, let's look at a particular vertex. So we're, we're going to do the same thing as we did when we defined graphs. Let's look at a particular vertex. Uh, and look at the darts whose heads belong to that vertex or pointing towards that vertex, right? Okay, so for example, this vertex, the darts pointing to it, let's see, there, uh, I might have the signs wrong, A plus, B minus, and E minus. Yeah, A plus is coming in, Uh, B plus is coming in, and E plus. I think E plus is coming in. I usually draw. I usually draw the the, the two darts. Uh, in, in the U.S., we drive on the right side of the road, so I draw it as if the uh, the darts are on the right side. That's gonna really confuse us now that I'm in India here. So. As we saw before, a vertex defines a subset of darts, namely those darts that are pointing to that vertex. Okay? And we turn that around and defined the vertices uh, that way. 
So we're going to do the same thing for embeddings. We're going to define, we're going to define an, uh, an embedding in this way. So take the darts that are pointing to this vertex. They, they are ordered in a particular way. They form a cyclic arrangement around the vertex. Okay? So in this case, uh, if you go counterclockwise, it's E plus, then A plus, then, uh, what is that? Uh, B minus. Okay, so that's the cyclic arrangement. It's a cyclic, it's a permutation cycle. So for each vertex, we'll take a permutation cycle, and that will define a collection of permutation cycles. And a collection of permutation cycles, what did we decide that that was? That's an arbitrary permutation. So an embedding is really, in this telling of the story, a, a permutation on the darts. Okay? It's a somewhat odd definition, but it actually makes a lot of these proofs very easy. Okay, so that's what we define. An embedded graph is this permutation. We'll denote pi. Okay. So the way to think about the permutation is in terms of its, so far, is in terms of its permutation cycles. So a permutation, uh, a per permutation determines the permutation cycles. Okay. I see only one cycle. Yeah, sure. I see only one cycle, not cycles. Too. You see only what? One cycle. One cycle. For each vertex, there's a cycle, right? One, two, three, four. So there are four cycles here. Each vertex is a cycle. Well, each vertex, for each vertex there is a cycle, and the set of darts participating in that cycle are exactly the set of darts that comprise that vertex in the edge-centric view of graphs. Does that, does that clarify things? Okay, so, there's a, so given any permutation pi, there's an underlying graph, which is the partition where each part corresponds to one of the cycles. Pardon me? Uh, they, they, the permutation allows for self-loops. Yeah, okay. well, permutation cycle is self-loop. Yeah. Ah, a permutation is... It's not what I call a self-loop in a graph sense. It maps one dart, a permutation cycle maps uh, an element, say a dart, to another dart, to another dart, but eventually comes back. Okay, it could be that it comes back right away. Was there another question? Uh, now, I talked about the um, geometric definition of, of embeddings. And in the geometric world, there are these things called faces. So I'll just explain. So here's a face. The face formed by B, C, and E. So this region, that triangle is called a face. So this graph, imbe this embedded graph has three faces. Can we find them? All right, so here's one face. Here's another face. And where's the third face? Outside. Outside. So when we, when we consider a graph embedded on the plane, we say that there's one infinite face. Now, very, uh, if you, uh, you could take the same graph that's embedded on a plane and think of it embedded on a sphere, in which case there's no, one, there's no face is actually infinite. That gives us the freedom. We can designate any one and say that's our special face. We'll interpret that as an infinite whenever we need an infinite face. So that's the geometric definition of faces for, uh, with respect to a planar embedding. Now I'll tell you the, the combinatorial definition. Um, so first, I, first let me, uh, there's, this, there's, this there's this permutation uh, rev. Okay. Rev stands for reverse. This permutation is an involution. So it, uh, rev of, of, uh, of d minus is d plus. Rev of d plus is d minus. So you see, rev just reverses the order of a, of a dart, reverses the orientation of the dart. But it is a permutation. It's a permutation on the darts. Now, permutations are functions, so we can compose them. So I'm going to define dual of pi to be the composition of rev with pi. Okay, so that we've composed two permutations, we get another permutation. 
So let's see how that works. So uh, let's take let's take a minus. Here's a minus. Well, let, let pi star denote a uh, dual of pi. So I'll very often use uh, star to denote uh, things that are dual. I'll talk more about the dual in a moment. So pi star is uh, the, the, uh, the composition of rev with pi. So pi star of a minus is rev of pi of a minus. So what's pi of a minus? So here's a minus. Where is a minus? Uh, it's coming in here. The next dark incident to this vertex in counterclockwise order uh, is d plus. And the reverse of, so, so uh, rev of pi of a minus is rev of d plus. The reverse of d plus is d minus. So after, after, uh, after a minus, uh, a minus is mapped by pi star to d minus. What do you think d minus is mapped to? d minus is mapped to, using the same kind of reasoning, e plus. And e plus is finally mapped to a minus. So what we see is that this permutation uh, applied repeatedly traces out what we considered the boundary of a face. Okay, this is the face. So this is an easy, this is a convenient way of describing the faces of, a, of an embedded, uh, embedded graph without talking about topology and connected components and geometry. Now, once we have a permutation pi star on a set of darts, what do we have? A permutation on a, on a set of darts is a, it's an embedded graph. So pi star is another embedded graph, and that's called the dual. Now, again, there's a geometric definition, the traditional geometric definition of the dual. So I'll go through that because that's intuitive and it works with pictures. So here's this blue graph. To find the dual of that graph, you create a new vertex or a node uh, in the middle of every face, including the infinite face. Okay, so in the dual graph, there's a, uh, a, there's a dual node for every primal vertex. Primal refers to the original graph. Now, what about the edges? There's an edge in the dual graph for each edge of the primal graph. And the way you draw it is you draw it roughly perpendicular to the original primal edge. So here's an edge of the primal graph, and here's the corresponding edge of the dual graph, and it connects two dual vertices. Okay. So that's the geometric uh, uh, or combinatorial definition, although uh, given, given fairly informally. But combinatorially, uh, it's very simple. The dual, the dual uh, graph is an embedded graph whose permutation is dual of pi, which I very often write pi star. And here's a quick proof that uh, the dual of the dual is back to the original graph, the primal. So why is that? Okay, let's apply the dual to pi and then apply it to, uh, once more. So dual of dual of pi. Dual of, the definition of dual of pi is the, the, the uh, permutation you get by composing rev with pi. So dual of rev of, uh, of, this, of this permutation. Well, the definition of dual is you apply rev to this, uh, compose rev with this. So it's rev composed with rev composed with pi. Because functional composition is associative, the two revs cancel out, and you're, you're left with pi. So, so that shows you that taking the dual twice gets you back to the original graph. Which is a fairly complicated thing to prove if you're using topological or geometric arguments. But it's easy uh, using the combinatorial definition. Okay, now what's, what's deletion from, a, from an embedded graph? Deletion sort of means pulling, pulling uh, uh, the two darts corresponding to an edge out of, out of the permutation. Uh, I won't give a complete formal definition, but in the case where uh, uh, the graph has no subfloops, it's pretty simple. So given a, an embedding pi, we define a new, uh, uh, 
we define a new uh, embedding pi prime by removing a dart. Okay, so uh, if D is a dart, let's say we're removing this D hat uh, dart, pi prime of, if D is not that, D, that, that dart we're removing, then it's e uh, the, uh, we either just apply pi, or, it, or if the result of applying pi is, one of the, is this forbidden dart, we just apply pi once more. Okay. Now, the idea of, for, de for deleting, deleting an edge, you just delete the two darts associated with it. Okay. Now, remember, remember uh, this idea of contraction. I showed these two, two examples. It turns out that uh, assuming that E is, is not a self loop in, in the primal graph, then uh, if you want to delete, if you want to contract E, you just do deletion in the, in the dual. Okay. So, uh, in terms of the operation on the graph, just, just form the, pro the dual graph, do the deletion operation on the edge, and now go back to uh, apply dual once more to get back to some modified version of the original graph, and it'll turn out to have this property. It'll, it, it, it'll be as if you contracted that edge, but you get to preserve the embedding. You get an embedding uh, out of it. So I use the term compression uh, to mean delete this edge in the dual. So geometrically, an embedding of a planar, uh, 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 an embedding, embed, embedding of a graph is planar if the embedding is onto a surface that has genus zero. It's basically the sphere or a plane. Uh, and Euler made this very interesting uh, observation. Uh, N minus M plus V equals two uh, for polyhedra. This is Euler's formula, where N is the number of nodes, vertices, M is the number of edges, and V is the number of faces. So we turn that around and define an embedding to be a planar embedding if this formula holds for it. Okay. Uh, and it's not hard to show uh, using this, uh, perhaps, perhaps you'll do that, that the dual of a planar embedded graph is also planar using this formula. That if the primal, the original graph satisfies this formula, then so does the dual. Uh, it's a little harder, but it's still not too hard to show that deletion and contraction preserves planarity. So if you start with a planar embedded graph, you contract or, uh, or delete an edge, you still get a, con uh, a planar graph. And here's one more thing, which is very useful. Uh, sparsity lemma, I call it. In a, in a planar graph with certain properties, the number of edges is not too much more than the number of uh, vertices. M is at most 3n minus 6. And this is when each face has size at least three. Uh, and for many problems, at least the initial graph can be assumed to have no self-loops. If you had a face of size one, it would have to, be, it would have to involve a self-loop. So no self-loops means no faces of size one. For many of these problems, you can assume there are no parallel edges. Uh, and if you had a face of size 2, it would involve parallel edges. So no, no parallel edges implies no faces of size 2. So the sparsity lemma applies to such uh, graphs. Uh, and we, uh, we can, we can uh, uh, ensure that the number of edges is, not, is uh, at most three times the number of nodes. OK. Uh, our, how familiar are people with minimum spanning trees? Is that anyone sort of uh, minimum spanning tree? Maybe not. Anybody doesn't know what minimum spanning tree is? Nobody does. Okay. <laughs> Depends on how you vote. Uh, so here, here's a sort of an abstract version of, a, of an algorithm for minimum spanning tree. I haven't specified all the steps. So if G has no edges, the minimum spanning tree is empty. Otherwise, take some edge that you can be guaranteed is contained in the minimum spanning tree and contract it. Eliminate some parallel edges and, and, uh, and uh, recursively find the minimum spanning tree of the resulting graph. Now, you can show that this edge can be chosen by the sparsity lemma. You can show that the edge can be chosen 
very quickly. And so you can get this algorithm to run in linear time. So we might, might have an exercise on that one. That's one algorithm for computing the, the minimum spanning tree. You don't need to do it that way. There are many algorithms for computing the spanning tree, minimum spanning tree. This is one that runs in linear time. Well, this algorithm has to be more fully specified. And that's sort of the, the problem. Sorry, what is the? What is the D with the weight of the edges? That is not mentioned there. Yes. Well, so this is, this is actually a very high level uh, description. This is intended as an exercise uh, to come up with this. Uh, so we may, or may, we may or may not include this as, as one of the exercises. But, so I can, I can give you a little bit of an idea. In, in step two, you have to choose some edge to contract, this edge uh, E hat. And so in order to choose that edge, you have to look at uh, the weights. So here's a way to find an edge that's guaranteed to be in a minimum spanning tree. Take some vertex, look at all the edges incident to that vertex, and choose the one of minimum weight. The one of minimum weight incident to that vertex must be in the minimum spanning tree. And so you can take that one. So that's, that's actually what's going on in step two. We're picking a vertex such that, uh, and then we, we, we look at all the edges incident to it, and then we, uh, we identify the fact that it has no, uh, we, we identify the minimum cost uh, edge incident to it, minimum weight edge, and declare that the, the edge to be contracted. Now that, in order for this algorithm to run in linear time, what I want is for that step to run in constant time. Now how can, that, how can I hope to run that in constant time? Any ideas? Under what circumstances is it very easy to, to do that step in constant time? So I have a, a vertex, I, uh, I have some representation of the graph, maybe with darts. If that vertex only has some small number, uh, at most, say, at most uh, six edges incident to it, I can look at all those edges, find the one that's minimum, and declare that's my edge E hat. That's my way of defining it. Now, how do I find a, a vertex who, uh, that has at most six incident edges, and why does there even always exist one? That turns out to be a consequence of the sparsity lemma. Because of sparsity, there aren't, just aren't that many edges to run around, so some vertex has got to have a small number of edges incident to it. In fact, on average, most vertices will have uh, very few, very few edges incident to them. So this, this gives you a way of finding a minimum spanning tree in linear time in a planar graph. Now even in general graphs, it's possible to find uh, a minimum spanning tree in linear time, at least according to a theoretical, a theoretical algorithm, but using randomization. That, that'll have to be, I'll have to save that for another lecture someday. Okay, here's a beautiful result. Uh, you, can, you can find the proof in the lecture notes. Uh, beautiful result about planar graphs uh, and very useful in algorithms for planar graphs. So let's say we have a planar embedded graph and we have a, a, a spanning tree T for that planar graph. Take all the edges that are not in that spanning tree. These are what we called the non-tree edges earlier on. Those edges that were not in the spanning tree T form a spanning tree of the planar dual. And it's called interdigitating trees, uh, interdigitating referring to the fingers. So if, you, if this is one tree, then the other tree looks something like this. Okay. So I've drawn a, a, an example there. Uh, the black graph uh, is indicate, uh, the graph has a spanning tree indicated with the solid, the, the, the thick black edges. So we take all the edges that are not in that black spanning tree. 
we look at those edges in the, in the dual. And they form a spanning tree of the dual. So this is, this is the kind of, this is, this is why it's useful to have an edge-centric view of uh, definition of graphs. Because you can speak of the edges uh, in one graph uh, and, 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 and the same edges in, the, in, in a completely different graph, uh, the dual. Okay. And one constant, does anyone have a question about the interdigitating tree? Okay. So here's a, here's a consequence, not too difficult. So r recall that we defined the fundamental cut corresponding to an edge of a spanning tree. So here's the edge of the spanning tree. The fundamental cut is these four edges that cross from one side of the spanning tree to the other. That's a fundamental cut uh, in the primal graph. You take those same edges in the dual, the same edges forming that cut, these four edges. Take that same, those same edges in the dual, these form a cycle. In particular, they form a fundamental cycle. So remember this idea of a fundamental cycle. Given a, a spanning tree and, a, and an edge not in that spanning tree, for example, this edge, there's a cycle formed by that edge together with the path in the spanning tree connecting its endpoints. So the fundament, uh, any fundamental cut in the primal Though the edges forming that fundamental cut form a fundamental cycle in the dual, and vice versa. So here's, here's, uh, here we show it going the other way. Here's a, here, um, here's a, in the, in the, with respect to this primal uh, black tree, this is a non-tree edge. So it forms a cycle. There's the path between its endpoints plus that edge forms a cycle that's called a fundamental cycle. And, um, and the same edges, uh, the edges of that cycle uh, for, uh, form a, uh, a cut uh, in, in, the, uh, in the dual. And it's a fundamental cut with respect to the dual spanning tree. So what's a fundamental cut? You take one edge of that spanning tree, this edge, and you look at those edges in the graph that connect the vertices on one side of that edge to the ones on the other side. So those are, th those are these edges. Okay, so that's fundamental cut, fundamental cycle duality. And we can generalize that slightly to uh, consider any simple cuts and simple cycles. So this is a simple cycle. By simple it means, uh, I mean that no vertex occurs more than once on that cycle. Here's a simple cut. Okay, it's a, uh, the cut is the set of edges connecting two parts of the graph. It's considered a simple cut if those two parts are individually connected. So this part is connected and this part is connected. So the edges joining them are a simple cut. And the theorem states that, uh, I seem to have scrolled too far. Edges form a simple, uh, a simple cut in the primal if and only if they form a simple cycle in the dual. So this is cut cycle duality. Uh, in this picture, I've shown a non-simple cut. So consider uh, the partition consisting of these vertices and all the rest. So that's not a simple cut because while these vertices form a connected graph, all the rest do not. The rest of the vertices include these vertices and these vertices, and they are not connected in the primal graph. So this is not a simple cut. And in fact, if you look at the edges corresponding to that cut, the edges that, that, separate, that, that join this graph, this subgraph to the rest, they don't form a simple cycle. There's this vertex that's shared uh, that occurs more than once in the cycle. So that's not a simple cycle. 
with these edges? In both cases, those are the edges of the cut. The edges joining one part to the, to the other. It also looks like a fundamental cut. Sorry, I couldn't hear. Those set of blue edges also look like a fundamental cut. Well, a fundamental cut is, uh, is defined with respect to a particular spanning tree. Uh, so you could define a spanning tree with respect to which this would be a fundamental cut. But what I'm saying is even if you don't have a spanning tree in mind, there's something that you can say about it. It's still a, it's still a cut, and it's a cut of a particularly nice structure. Of course, every, every fundamental cut is a simple cut. Why is, the, why is that? Both sides are connected. Is that what you said? Sorry? Yeah. Yeah. You just take the part of the spanning tree, you, 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 you take the spanning tree, you remove that one edge, you've got two parts and they're each connected. So it's obvious that, they're, that it's a simple cut. Okay. But, uh, you, so you, and you can imagine, you can go the other way. You can show that any, any, any uh, simple cut corresponds to uh, a simple cycle. All right, now here, this is just a, a picture of the different ways that deleting an edge in the dual can have an effect on the primal. So I call that a compression operation. And I just thought that this is interesting. So as I said before, if you, if you, if, uh, if you let's consider this edge. If, if, if you uh, delete an edge of the dual that in the primal is not a self-loop, then it acts just like contraction. So that's this picture. This, this edge gets contract, uh, this, if you delete this edge, you're merging these two into a single, a single face. So it acts like contraction. In this case, uh, you do have a self-loop. So something interesting, well, something not very interesting happens. Uh, in this case, the self-loop only doesn't contain any other vertices. It's a pretty simple self-loop. So in that case, uh, this acts just like deleting the edge. You've just deleted that self-loop. And now here's a slightly more interesting case. Here's, here you have a, a self-loop, and there's stuff embedded inside it as well as outside it. In this case, what happens when you do what I call the compression, when you delete that edge in the, in the, in the dual, is that the graph breaks into two parts. It's that one part includes uh, the stuff that was enclosed by that self-loop and the other, that's this part, and the other includes the stuff that was not enclosed, that's this part. And, th and this vertex through which the self-loop went is duplicated. There are now two copies of it. It's another illustration of why an eccentric view of graphs is better uh, when you're doing these contractions and these compressions. The vertices are, are all over the place, but the edges remain. Uh, unless you explicitly remove them. So this is a transformation that breaks a graph uh, uh, into two graphs. Well, it breaks a, a connected graph into uh, a disconnected graph, I should say. OK, so I'm just, uh, this, these interdigitating trees are the basis for a lot of, uh, a lot of fun and efficient algorithms. Uh, so uh, here's, here's one that I'll ask you to work on. Um, given a, a planar graph, planar embedded graph, and a spanning tree, for each non-tree edge, find, uh, so consider the spanning tree is rooted somewhere. So it's all dangling from some one vertex. For each non-tree edge, find the least common ancestor in the tree of the, of the endpoints of that edge. So you can do that in linear time for each edge independently. But it turns out that for planar graphs, uh, and I'll, I'll put this on, uh, I'll, I'll point you to this uh, on the web, so you don't have to, you don't have to copy this down uh, right now. But I'm just uh, introducing the problem. You want, a, uh, you want an algorithm that will find all these least common ancestors uh, in one go in linear time. Uh, using the solution to this, you can solve this problem as well. Similarly, given a graph with, uh, with uh, a spanning tree and given weights on the spanning tree, you can find for every non-tree edge, you can find the sum of the weights of the edges on the path through the tree between those endpoints. 
Now clearly you can, you can do that in linear time pretty simply for each individual edge, but it turns out you can, uh, you can do all of those in linear time. This is an illustration of my favorite algorithmic design principle, which is never buy retail. You always want to buy. Uh, the, the one way to get very efficient algorithms is to, uh, is to do lots of things all, in, all at once. Buying, buying wholesale is better. In the tree. There's a unique uh, simple path between any two vertices in the tree. If you had, multi if you had multiple paths, then there'd be a cycle there somewhere. How are we doing time-wise? Uh, half hour. All right, good. So I, I, I'm going to go over the, uh, the MSSP. I'm going to illustrate at a very high level uh, an, uh, an algorithm uh, that I did that based on this idea of interdigitating trees that turns out to be useful in many, many other planar graph algorithms. So um, it has to do with shortest path trees. I haven't really gone over, so uh, we won't be going into them in, in, in great detail, though. So, I've drawn a planar graph uh, somewhat schematically. So you imagine that this, this disk is a planar graph. And there, there are a bunch of vertices on the boundary of that disk. Those represent that the boundary of the disk is uh, the boundary of the infinite phase. And our goal will be to find shortest paths uh, from each of the vertices on the boundary of the infinite phase. And we're going to use this notion of the interdigitating tree. So uh, if the red, tree, it, the red tree is the spanning tree of the primal, this blue tree is the interdigitating spanning tree of the dual. Uh, let's see here. Just one sec. So we're going to compute all the shortest path trees, in some sense, in n log n time. OK, there are faces of G. So we take both of those, and we call that uh, the face vertex instance graph. So for example, here is a fragment of a graph uh, showing one face. So the vertices of the uh, face vertex instance graph include these four vertices of the original graph, together with a vertex for this face and a vertex for the neighboring faces as well. And one of the edges of the face vertex instance graph, there's an edge between a vertex representing an original vertex and a vertex representing a face if the face and the vertex are incident, if the vertex is on the boundary of the face. So in this case, the face has four incident vertices. And so in the face vertex instance graph, there are these four edges connecting uh, the node corresponding to that face to, the, to those vertices. And we also retain the original No. Only? No, just, the, uh, just these edges. So here's, a, here's an example. Here's a planar graph. And now I've shown, you can barely see and very lightly drawn the original edges. That's supposed to indicate that they're not part of my graph. Uh, there are these, uh, these white uh, uh, nodes that represent vertices of the original graph. And then there's these yellow nodes that represent faces of the original graph. Okay, so that's the basic idea of the face vertex incidence graph. And the theorem states that if, if, you hap if there happens to be a vertex, of the face instance graph, such that every other vertex in the face instance graph is not too far from it, then there's a low branch width, uh, a low width branch decomposition. So suppose, suppose every other vertex of the face vertex instance graph is within p hops of that vertex r. Then there's a branch decomposition of width at most p.
All right, so I'll give a sketch of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, of the proof. I'm going to leave out the interesting parts. The medial graph is just defined to be the planar dual of the, uh, of the face vertex instance graph. So here in this nice complicated picture, we have in black an original planar graph. In green we have, or a fragment of it, in green we have the corresponding fragment of the face vertex incidence graph. And in red, uh, we have, I, I've drawn the dual of the face, ver face vertex instance graph, the medial graph. And uh, you can see from this picture that the vertices of the medial graph correspond to edges of the original graph. So here they are. These are the, these are the examples of vertices of the medial graph. The degree of, e and, and, and what are they connected to? Well, these, these edges, so uh, look, at this, look at this face. Here's a face. Okay, after this edge, the next edge in the face is this one. And the in the medial graph, the corresponding vertex is connected to the next vertex in the face. It's also connected to the previous one. Okay, look at this face. This vertex representing this edge is connected to the vertex representing the next edge and the previous one, or the next edge and the previous one. So uh, because each face, uh, because each edge is in exactly two faces, and uh, each face contributes degree two to a vertex of the medial graph, the degree of the medial graph is four. So we get a, a degree four uh, a graph here, and the vertices are the edges. Uh, the vertices of the medial graph are the edges of the original, correspond to the edges of the original graph. Okay. So here's the lemma that we use to get the branch decomposition theorem. If you had a carving decomposition of the medial graph, a carving decomposition, right? So these, this is a, uh, a set of vertex clusters with good width, you can convert it to a branch decomposition of the original graph. And what happens to the width? It actually goes down by a factor of two. So it's not this, I'm not going to prove this lemma, but it's not so surprising, right? You saw in this picture that the, that the vertices of the medial graph correspond to the edges of the original graph. So it's not surprising that a vertex cluster for the medial graph can be interpreted as an edge cluster of the original graph. And that's just how this, pro that's how this proof goes. So it's not very, it's, it's a little technical paragraph, not that complicated. Okay, so we got the picture. You can convert a, a carving decomposition of the medial graph into a branch decomposition of the original graph. And the width, in fact, goes down by a factor of two. So how do we prove the main theorem here? Well, let's review what the main theorem said. This is, let's see. Uh, I have another copy. Okay, we're not going to do that. As Ravi points out, I'm using only half my screen. Uh, so here's the theorem. So if every vertex is close in the media, close in the face vertex instance graph to some vertex R, then you get a good branch decomposition of that graph. And here's the basic idea. So let T star denote this, this uh, breadth first search tree of the, of the face vertex instance graph. So this, by the assumption of the theorem, this is a very shallow breadth first search tree. Every vertex in the, in the face vertex instance graph is within P hops of R. 
As a consequence, in T star, every simple path has at most how many edges? If every vertex is at most p hops from the root r, two, two times that. Right, so two, uh, so 2p. Now, the dual of face vertex instance graph is m of g. m of g is a bipartite graph. Uh, and it has degree at most four. So, by the, the uh, lemma I stated earlier, you get, a, uh, you get a carving decomposition of the medial graph. Uh, and the, the, the width is 2p, right, the, length, the, the bound on the length of the uh, simple path, plus 4 minus 4, so we get back to 2p. And now, the transfer la applying the transformation lemma to that, we get a branch decomposition of the original graph, the original planar graph of width at most p. So before I go on, I'll mention there are other results on branch decompositions of planar graphs. In fact, uh, in fact there's, a, there's an algorithm uh, to find the optimal branch decomposition of a planar graph, the uh, branch decomposition of having minimum width. But we're not going to use that in what goes forward, in, in what we do next. We're going to use this, this, this theorem uh, that shows the existence of a, of, of a branch decomposition of a particularly small width. Yep. Yeah, it's trivial. It's one of those things you have to think about for a little while, and then you're. So why is it, why is it bipartite? Uh, Fe. There are faces and vertices, and the edges only go from face vertices to vertex vertices. Say it again. Um, not a reliable relation, but it tends to be. You're, you're you're better off using branch decomposition if you can, because of this degree problem. Problem, you know. In general graphs, the degree might be quite large, but the branch decomposition can be quite small. But there, there isn't this close connection as there is in planar graphs. And even in planar graphs, it's, it's between specific kinds of graphs, right? Okay. Yes? That's right. Between what? This one? Oh, yeah. I guess I was wrong. No, I think there's a mistake. I, I think you're right. The, the, uh, huh? Yeah, there's an error in my, in my diagram. Thanks for pointing that out. Well, can we hope to get min weight vertex cover in a planar graph? Well, the answer is no, not if we want to spend only polynomial time and if we believe that p is not equal to np. The problem is np hard even in planar graphs. But we can get the next best thing, which is called an approximation scheme. So here's what an approximation scheme is. It's a family of algorithms. For any, so you've seen in, in the past days, you've seen approximation algorithms. So this is the family of approximation algorithms. For any epsilon bigger than zero, there is a 1 plus epsilon approximation algorithm. Okay? A so, an algorithm that's guaranteed to return a solution whose weight is at most 1 plus epsilon times optimal. Now these things, this is an approximation scheme. And there exists such a scheme for min weight vertex cover in planar graphs. There does not exist such a scheme for min weight vertex cover in general graphs. We know, we, we know that assuming p is not equal to np, uh, that even getting this kind of thing is, we, we can't expect to get this. And, it, and in fact, for many problems, it's, it, it's known that you can't get approximation schemes for general graphs. 
And slowly, we're, we're uncovering uh, approximation schemes for planar graphs for many of these problems. So I mentioned min weight vertex cover. There's also min weight edge dominating set, min weight independent set, max weight set of edge disjoint triangles. I'll talk about some of these examples in the remaining time, which is how much? About uh, 40 minutes. 40? 40, 45. Okay. All right, first I have to remind you of breadth first search. Okay, this is... Uh, now, breadth first search in a planar graph doesn't... You, it's not really good to think of it uh, as looking like that. There's a, uh, here's a messier but more uh, reliable picture of breadth first search. Okay, so you should think of it more like this, where this is the start vertex, and the next, ver the next level of vertices are along here, and the next level is in here. They form... They, uh, the vertices form rings, uh, and, and that's basically because uh, they form, uh, they, you, you, you get these, these, uh, these simple cuts. And so their boundaries are simple cycles in the dual, uh, and so they, you can line them up nicely. Now it may not be circle under, so they may, there may be, here there are some uh, multiple cycles inside. So that's sort of what breadth first search looks like in a planar graph. All right, now let's look at the, the graph obtained by considering some sequence of k consecutive levels of breadth first search. Okay, so k levels of breadth first search. Let, let vi be the vertices of level i, and now what we're considering is for some i, we consider the graph induced on the vertices of level i plus 1, the vertices of level, oops, uh, i plus 2, up to uh, i plus k. That graph, just the induced subgraph, has branch width at most 2k. So why is that? So here's the basic idea. So you have a graph, you want to focus on those vertices at levels i plus 1, through i plus k for some integers i and k. We'll take all the vertices at levels greater than i plus k and just throw them away. Delete them from the graph. Take all the vertices at levels uh, uh, 0 through i and contract the part of the breadth for a search tree that connects them to a single vertex. A new group we call r prime. So now what we have is a graph. Uh, we have this R prime. The next level are vertices that were originally at level I plus 1. And the next, then we have vertices originally at level I plus 2. And so on up to K. So how many levels does this graph have? What's the, uh, what's the number of hops, the radius uh, uh, of, of the graph rooted at R prime? K. Yeah. If I chose I plus 1, it, it, I'm a little screwed up with the I plus 1. But. All right. So this, this graph has, uh, has radius uh, uh, K. And therefore, using the previous theorem, it has branch width at most I think it's 2K. Branch width at most 2K. Now, this isn't the graph that we wanted. We wanted the graph induced on levels I plus 1 through K. And this is a graph that we obtained by doing these contractions and stuff. So how do we, well, the way we get the graph induced is we just delete that vertex R prime. OK? And we know that deletion does not increase the width. So we still have a, a, a low tree width, a low uh, branch width graph. Is that all right? All right. So now I'm going to explain how to get uh, an approximation scheme for vertex uh, cover. And this approach, this methodology, can apply to a number of problems. And we'll see some other examples. So. We take the graph, 
take, the, take our input graph, it's a planar graph, and do breadth first search and assign levels to it. Now what we're going to do is uh, decompose it. We're gonna, so let's, here's a picture of, of, of how we might decompose the graph. Okay. For some Q, we might take level Q, Q plus 1, up to Q plus K. And then we take, and that's going to be one, one subgraph. And then we'll take levels Q plus K, Q plus K plus 1, up to Q plus 2K. And so on. Levels Q plus 2K, Q plus Q 2K plus 1, up to Q plus 3K. So we're going to have a lot of different uh, subgraphs obtained in this way. But each subgraph we get has a nice property. It consists of, uh, I guess, k plus 1 consecutive levels of breadth first search. And therefore, what? It has low branch width. And therefore, we can solve problems optimally in that graph in time exponential in k. So we can solve, for example, vertex cover. So the idea is going to be, break up your graph into these pieces. Solve vertex cover uh, in each of those pieces optimally using a dynamic program. And then take the solutions and put them together. All right. Why would we think that that would be uh, a, good, a good idea? I mean, it might not be. So there are two properties that we use here. One is called the whole to part property. Or I call it this anyway. And the other is the, is the part to whole property. So the whole to the part. The property that we want is, uh, the first simple property is, an optimal solution, or any solution, for the whole graph induces solutions on the parts. And that is pretty easy to see. In this, for this particular problem. A vertex cover is a set of vertices such that every edge has at least one of them uh, as, as an endpoint. So if you take a vertex cover for the whole graph and now break it into parts on this form, each part is also going to, the, the, the optimal, the, the uh, set of vertices in the optimal solution for the original graph will certainly, uh, that, that happen to fall into that part, will provide a solution for that part as well. So that, the whole to part property is okay. What about the part to whole property? Or parts to whole, I should say. What I'd like to be the case is, if you find a solution within each part to the vertex cover, a vertex cover for each part, and you union those solutions together, you, I, I, I want the result to be a uh, vertex cover for the whole graph. Well, how's that? Is, that? is that true here? The reason it's true is that we chose these decompositions in a particular way. We chose them so that they overlap. So any edge, every edge in the original graph is in at least one, maybe two, are, are of these parts. So each edge will be covered, let's say an edge is in this middle part, it'll at least be covered by the vertex cover that we found for this graph. So the parts to whole property holds, uh, the parts to whole property is a, is a function not just of the problem, but also of the decomposition we chose. This particular decomposition with its overlapping uh, does give us the parts to whole property. The overlapping will be a disadvantage, however, when it comes to the analysis. Why should we think that this is a good algorithm in the sense of providing a near-optimal solution? Well, the, the, the whole to parts property helps. It says take the optimal solution. Okay, That induces solutions within the parts. So the optimal solution within a part is at most the intersection of the optimal solution with that part. 
So that's good news. But we've got a little bit of a problem here. Here's what we would get ideally. We, ideally, we would say that once you, you solve the, the problem in each of the parts and you union them together, ideally, the, the, the weight of the solution would be uh, the, 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 the weight of the optimum. Okay, but why is that not true? Okay, so imagine you have an optimum solution uh, on this graph. You break the graph into these parts. You find optimal solutions within those parts, and then you union them back together. Could the solution you get by union be more costly than the, solution, than the optimal solution for the whole graph? Right, right. Some edges could be covered twice. The reason, so we might choose, we might we might choose a vertex more than once. The fact that the that these things overlap means that uh, we have to be a little bit careful. So we have to use another analysis technique. Now I've I've told you I decompose the graph, but you actually the algorithm requires you to do it not once but k times, k or k plus one times. So let me show you the pseudocode for the algorithm. OK, so we do breadth-first search. Now, we're, our goal is to find a solution uh, whose cost is at most 1 plus epsilon times the optimal cost. Let k be 1 over epsilon. That's how we choose k. And now, we do this same decomposition many times. Uh, so this, let's go through the formal. So uh, for i equals uh, 0, 1 up to k minus 1, let g i j denote the subgraph consisting of vertices at levels j k plus i through j plus 1 k plus i. Okay. So you think of I as, a, as a, a modular residue class. So for, every, for each choice of I, you get a different decomposition of this form. In particular, the areas of intersection. So for such a decomposition, you get these areas of intersection between consecutive parts. So here's the intersection. So for each i, you're shifting this decomposition down. So for each i, you get a different, uh, different part of the graph uh, belonging to that intersection, the, 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 uh, the intersecting parts, the intersection of parts. OK. So let's see. Um, I'll try to get the analysis. Take the optimal solution. I think I'm going to have to go to the. Uh, I think I'll go to the board now. Let me turn on some lights for that. Let there be light. <laughs> okay. 